One of the greatest needs we have is to know and understand ourselves. Even with modern technology, we still fail to comprehend why we cannot control our emotions or willpower. In this teaching, my father, Dr. Lester Sumrall, will explain how each person is a triune being composed of body, soul, and spirit. These three components form the intricate workings of the human personality. Please stay tuned and enjoy today's lesson on the total man. One of the greatest needs of man is to know and understand himself. Man has made great strides in technology, yet he fails to comprehend why he cannot control his emotions or willpower. Every human should know that he is a triune personality, body, soul, and spirit. Dr. Sumrall has designed the Total Man Teaching Series to help you understand the intricate workings of your personality. Hi, everybody. I am very fortunate to be privileged to teaching such a beautiful uh, group of people, representing many towns, many areas, many walks of life, many denominations. Uh, and in our class, there are those representing a, a Catholics, all kinds of Protestants, and so forth. And you're just so welcome together. There's only one Bible, <laughs> just one Bible. And so, <laughs> as long as you stick with the Bible, we're in fellowship, I can assure you. Uh, we are studying the, maybe one of the greatest aspects of theology, really, the total man. What is a man? As I've told you constantly, there, there are three great areas uh, of knowledge to attain in this world in order to live properly. One is God. How, how can a person know how to live if he doesn't know the fellow that made the earth yet? Uh, you see? Until a person has a knowledge of God, he doesn't know where he is, who he is, there, where he came from, or where he's going. And so the knowledge of God is so important to the human person. And, and we should set our minds to say, hey, I'm going to find out about God and learn to know God. And then after God, rather than learning physics and, and, and learning astronomy, we need to learn man, our neighbor. There are men that, that live with a woman for 50 years and then divorce her. I don't understand you. Well, honey, after 50 years, if you don't understand, there's something wrong with your thinking. You see, we don't try to understand one another. We are selfish. We want to understand ourselves and, and, and not one another. But happy living has to do with appreciating one another. In, in my living around the world, in the 100 countries of the world, I, I found out that I had to learn to love the Chinese on the basis of being a Chinese. You still there? And I had to learn the Russians. I, when we were in Russia, and, and, and they put... Uh, a marmalade or, or, or some kind of a, a cooked up fruit in their tea for sweetening. I did too. I just took the jam, put it in there, stirred it around. I'm not going to tell you how it tasted. I was a Russian at the moment. And when they ate their kind of food, I ate it. They said, let's have a Russian bath. Well, I went out to that little outhouse out there where they throw water on stones and almost suffocate you. And they got in there and took a bath, Russian style. I didn't say, I'm going to wait till I get home and get in the bathtub. No, <laughs> it's safe. Oh, that we can learn to appreciate one another and love one another, you know. And then the, the third great area is to know ourselves. And that's what we're talking about, the total man. People stumble through life and don't know themselves. They don't know. And they'll say, I didn't know I'd do that. That don't sound like me. <laughs> you don't know yourself yet. You've got to come to know the fellow that lives behind the knoll. And it, it's not easy, but it's possible. We are discussing in this, in this time period of the total man a division of soul and spirit. Now, we have given you the chemistry of the spirit and the chemistry of the soul, and uh, we're going to finally, I think, give you the chemistry of the body, too. But uh, the dividing, the dividing uh, of soul and spirit, who can do it, you see? Uh, we read in the book of Hebrews 4 and 12, the Word of God. That's the Bible, the Word of God. Say Word of God. Word of God. That's the Bible. Is living. I don't know what translation you have there, but it's living. It is powerful. The Bible. God's Bible. <laughs> it's, it's not a daily newspaper, and, it, and it's, it's, it's not a catalog from Sears Roebuck or somebody. It's living. It is powerful. It is sharp. 
sharper than any knife you've ever had in your kitchen. It can pierce to the dividing between soul and spirit. Only the Bible has the information of piercing, it says here, piercing soul from spirit. And it can take the joints and the marrow. <laughs> the joints and the marrow, you see. And divide it. It says the Bible is a discerner, a, a manifestation, a bringing forth into light of the thoughts. Now that's beyond psychology and psychiatry, you see. The thoughts, the intents of the human heart, of your emotional being and your soul parts. Now that shows us where we go to to find this information. You go to other places, you don't get it. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, The God, the very God of all peace, all tranquility in heaven or earth, that God, the true God, may he sanctify you, spirit, soul, and body, set apart unto God, spirit, soul, and body. And he says, I pray that your whole entire person, this is 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, composed of spirit, soul, and body be preserved. God wants them all preserved, kept. Blameless, blameless, no argument, no argument, blameless, clean, pure, until the return of Jesus. <laughs> the reason I'm working on this, Jesus hadn't got back yet. And I'm held responsible. In my boyhood and growing up, nobody that I met understood what I'm talking about. We, 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 heard, we heard sermons uh, that were not related to just disjoining you and putting you back together again. Never heard one in my life, really, until I began to preach it myself. And others began to, 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 to say, yeah, that's true, and also began to give it out. But for 20 years, I searched, trying to find it, and couldn't hit on it until one morning about 2 o'clock in the morning, God revealed it to me. And brother, it's been growing ever since. It's growing like a good vine. <laughs> it doesn't even stop growing. Almost every day I put more notes in there because it is God's truth. He said that this God of your entire whole spirit, and that's your human spirit, your human spirit. Your human spirit is your born-again nature. Your soul, your mind, your emotions, and your will, and your body with its five parts that they be preserved, they be kept blameless. All of you are blameless. <laughs> All of you are blameless. Your body, your mind, your emotions, your will, blameless. Ooh, perfect. Until Jesus gets you. Now you say, what's the dividing process, Brother Sumlow? <laughs> the spiritual man and the natural man, number one, are different. They're separate, and they're against each other. So there's no harmony there. Harmony, harmony can only come out of rulership. Now, if the solo command becomes a ruler, the spiritual man just dies. He just goes off and quits. If the spiritual man becomes the king of your life, then he dictates to the mind, the emotions, and the will, and says, there's another way of living. <laughs> there's another way of life. There's another power. I'm going to get you acclimated to it. I'm going to get you to know that power. That power is divine, it is holy, it is pure, it is from God. Mind, you got to think straight. Emotions, you got to feel straight. Will, you got to walk straight and decide straight. And so uh, the spirit man becomes the Lord and the champion of your life, subjecting the total personality to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. So the spiritual man and the natural man as enemies can only be divided, separated, segregated, understood, because there is a sword, which is the Word of God, of the Spirit, God's holy Word. Now, the devil always has his counterfeits. Philosophy. He says, I'll study man and I'll tell you about man. They end up, all they know anything about is his solical parts and his physical parts, two compartments. They miss out the third part, the biggest part, the best part, and the eternal part, and they, they, they miss out. They miss out on it. Philosophy cannot divide. They cannot tell you what is spirit, what is soul, because they don't know. They have no idea. You come to science. 
They cannot divide the soul from the spirit any more than philosophy can. You say why? Science does not know, doesn't know too much about the soul, knows a lot about the corporate, knows a lot about the physical, knows a lot about the elements of the earth, the elements of the air, the elements of the sea, the elements of the moon, of the stars. Isn't that amazing? They can tell you out there, you know, five billion miles away, and they can't look behind your nose and tell you what's going on in there. Brother, rather than so many telescopes and each microscopes, we need to start looking down inside. Our jails are full. Our mental institutions are full. Our houses of correction are full. And our scientific laboratories are full. Why don't we get them together? You know, you'll never do it without a submission to God. Because man in his rebellion doesn't want God's way. And not going God's way, he never understands himself. He is a mystery to himself. Science as philosophy cannot divide the soul from the spirit. Now, Jesus, in order to uh, give you the dividing process of the, of the solical parts of a man, Jesus, Jesus called his body a temple in John 2, 18 and 21. Then Jesus answered the Jews and said unto them, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. This temple. So Jesus called his body a temple. Verse 20 says, And these then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in being builded. The natural man never understands God. When he said this temple, they couldn't see the temple of God. They could only see that great stone building that Herod had made, Herod's temple. That's all they could see. The natural man does not comprehend the things of God. You have to be born supernaturally into the family of God before you can understand the words of God. They said, 46 years we've been this temple, and will you rear it up in three days? <laughs> he was talking about his own body going into the grave for three days and coming out the resurrected master of the whole universe. Oh, glory to God. But he spake of the temple of his body. Now, I was only wanting to show you there that Jesus said his body was a temple with three compartments in it. Now, you, you better get ready to, uh, to look into your syllabus there and, and to find the the page that has it drawn on there for you, you know, the three, and, and uh, then you'll be able to see it very perfectly as we work through it here. Now, also the church is the temple of God. Now, therefore, ye are no more, this is Ephesians 2, 19. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, fellow citizens, with the saints and of the household of God. Verse 20. Ye are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together into a holy temple of the Lord. Isn't that amazing? The Bible specifically says here that the body of Christ, which is the church, is also the temple of God, collectively. The temple of God on the face of this earth. It says, in whom ye are built together, for an habitation of God through the Spirit with a capital S, meaning the personality of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. And so the church is the temple of God. How beautiful it is. And the church can live in three areas. The church can live by the Spirit. The church can worship by the Spirit. The church can grow by the Spirit. Or the church can move in the solical area of mind, emotions, and will and live in the, carn in the carnality of the human soul. And brother, it can even go into the body for your Jonah's fish fries, it can go into the body. And it can have dances and go into the body and live bodily, physically, outside of the grace, outside of the joy, outside of the peace of the Most High God. Now, if we look into the Bible, we find the whole Bible confirms this. Not only did Christ have the three compartments, and we're going to study his spirit, soul, and body uh, soon. But the church has it. The church can live by its spirit or by its soul or by its body. And, uh, and that would be a good subject to go into for a long time, how the church lives bodily, lives, lives right down there with the beggarly elements of the world. That's the way the Bible says it. And it lives in its emotional area, its willpower, outside of God, and then it can live spiritually. The church must decide how it should live before the Lord. Now, in the Hebrew worship of the Old Testament, 
There was the living of spirit, soul, and body. And in the tabernacle of Jehovah, in the tabernacle of the Lord, uh, there were three compartments that we'll get into and show you. In 1 Corinthians 3 and 16, it says, Know ye not that ye, that's one, two, you, me, know ye not that ye, us, you, that we are the temple of God. Now, you've got to believe the Bible or not believe it, you know. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. So not only, not only was Christ the temple of God, not only is the church the temple of God, as individuals, we are also the temple of God. Hebrews 9, 23 says it. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So God says, I must put a resemblance of what is in heaven, always three, on the earth, so that they might be, they might, the earth might be purified because of what it sees in the heavenly sphere and, and in the heavenly economics and in the heavenly operations. Verse 24 says, For Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures. Now, in the Old Testament, they were figures. Which were the figures of the true. But he has entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He is there in the Holy of Holies in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as a high priest entered into the holy place every year with blood for others. Verse 26 says, For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, in this book of Hebrews that we're reading to you from, there are over 90 verses, over 90 times about referring to the tabernacle of Jehovah of the tabernacle of God. Over 90 times in this one book it's referred to and the relationship it had with the New Testament, with God's people, and with us as persons. Now the tabernacle, if you have your syllabus open there, the tabernacle had three components, uh, three parts. And these three component parts of the tabernacle portray and reveal and show the three component parts of the human personality. Our text said man, is the temple of God in this dispensation. And so we must look at it. And if we don't mind, start with the inside. You, you, you've got it there. The, the inside is the Holy of Holies that represents the spirit of you. The spirit of you, the Holy of Holies. And here the Shekinah glory of the Godhead rested in the Holy of Holies onto the inside. Right outside through a great veil was the inner court of the holy place, which is the soul. In this area, there's a threefold activity. There's an altar, a table of showbread, and a candlestick. That altar is the mind. The lamps are the emotions, lamps flickering up and down. And the table of the showbread is the will of man. And so you had the three there. And beside those two compartments, the spirit, the soul, then you have the outer court of the body, the entire populace, anybody, could go into the outer court and, and they could visit there. But when it got to the inner court, uh, then you had to be a very particular person in order to enter in, into there. So this tabernacle with its three component parts, they reveal to us the Holy of Holies in the center, which is your spirit, where the Shekinah of God resided, resided continually, where man was permitted to go in there once a year, but in the, in the New Testament, we live in there. <laughs> we don't visit in there. We live in that spirit. We live in that Shekinah glory. And then the inner court, the right outside of that one, uh, the inner court of the holy place, is your solical parts. And in that solical parts, there's, a, there's an area of three activities. There was an altar there, a table of showbread there, and a candlestick there. And, and so in that, in that area, you have the altar of the mind, and you, and you have the lamps of emotions, and you have the table of the willpower. They're there. In the outer court, you have the body, the body system. And there the physical being of many could be there. Now, there were three entrances to this tabernacle to get inside. There was the gate of the outer court. You find that in Exodus 27, 16 to 19. Now, that represents your body. That's the outer court. 
And so to get into that innermost place there, they had door, they had gates. And the outer court had a gate. And we'll read it. And for the gate of the court shall be a hanging of 20 cubits of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine twine linen, linen through, wrought with needlework, and their pillars shall be four, and their, and their sockets shall be four. And verse 17 says, uh, all the pillars around about the court shall be uh, filleted with silver, their hooks shall be of silver, and their sockets shall be of brass. And verse 18 says, and the length of the court shall be a hundred and a hundred cubits. Uh, a, a cubit is about 18 inches. And, and the breadth of the court were 50, and the height were five cubits of fine twine linen, and, and their sockets of brass. And all the vessels and the tabernacle and all the service thereof, and all the pins thereof, and all the, and all the pins of the court shall be of brass. Now, we had time to symbolize those uh, brass and, and, uh, and, and the blue and the purple and the scarlet and so forth. Uh, we would go very much deeper into the human personality, very much deeper. But at this point, we're only trying to reveal to you that there is a power that divides the two and that it is divided all through the Word of God. It doesn't just divide now. It divided from the beginning of spiritual impartation, that when God said there should be a place of worship, the three were there, the spirit, the soul, and the body. They were there. In all Israel, that use a gate into the outer court, the human body is open to the extraneous experiences. You better believe it. That outer court of the human body is open to all kinds of extraneous experiences. It has to be subdued. It has to be taken care of. Paul says, I die daily. That old human nature, that body. Then there was another door into the holy place. In Exodus 26, 30, 36, it says, and, and, and thou shalt make a hanging for the door on the tent of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine, and fine, twain linen wrought with needlework, and thou shalt make for the hanging five pillars of, of shittim wood, overlay them with gold, and a hook shall be of gold, and thou shalt cast five brass, uh, sockets of brass for them, and o only the priests that enter and use the door into the holy place. The soul limits those who come in. The body, you, you could get on a, a subway, and, and brother, it bumps everybody. But your mind doesn't bump everybody. Your emotions don't bump everybody. Your will doesn't bump everybody. And so from the outer court, speaking of your body, rubbing here, rubbing there, pushing here, pushing there, it is controlled from the inner side. It says, relax here, pull back, don't touch. Move this way, touch, you see. And although your body is open for the multitudes to touch it, the inner man tells it who to touch, what to touch. That has to do with the dividing of the soul and the spirit. So now only the priests, the ones that should be, were in the holy place. So the soul limits those who attend to it. It limits those, I, I, my mind will go to you, my emotions will flow to you, my willpower will flow to you, and, and so your solical parts, it, it limits those who can get close to you and have a part of you. Now, to view the holiest of all in Exodus 26 and 31 to, uh, to 33, it says, And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine linen of cunning work with cherubim shall it be made, and thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of the shittim wood overlaid with gold, their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver, and thou shalt hang up the veil uh, un, un, unto the, under the tatches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil the ark of the testimony, which is made of gold. And the, and the veil shall divide, divide, that's what we're preaching about, is dividing. Divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. Only the high priest, only the high priest could pass the veil in the holiest of all. It's only God who can minister to your spirit. It is only God, only Jesus Christ, your high priest. Only Jesus Christ, your high priest, can minister fully to your spirit man. Now, there were three kinds of light in that tabernacle. On the outer court was the sunlight. The, the sunlight came right down from the heavens and hit the outer court. There was no covering over it. So the body is open to the elements. That's your body. It's open to the elements. It's open to darkness. It's open to light. It's open to so many things. Your body must be covered with the blood of Jesus. Your soul must take care of your body. And if it doesn't, your body can get into all kind of bad situations. The holy place was lit by a lampstand. Now, the soul is lighted by the mind, the emotions, and the will. And it's artificially lighted. So the soul can be lighted by you know, by the mind, by what it sees or hears or reads, and the emotions, uh, by who it meets and all kinds of situations, and the will also. But in the Holy of Holies, it was lit by the Shekinah presence of God. That's the Spirit. So the light of the Spirit is from God. Uh, the, the, the light 
of the soul is, is, is from man. It's from the old Adamic nature until it flows through from the inner. And out in the outside, of course, it's, it's, it's everybody out there. It's, it's just from the elements. Why is the dividing of the spirit and soul so necessary? Because in God, to live and to work unrestricted in you, you must have it divided. Sinners only know their soul, their soul functions. They don't know any spiritual functions. The Bible is either understood by the soul or mind or by the spirit, one of the two. If we meet the Lord in his word, it must be by the Holy Spirit. Only the spirit can give you the correct understanding of the word of God. No man can give it to you. It must be revealed by the spirit. The life of the spirit is the only, only dominant factor in you, conquering the whole soulical life. When your spirit touches God's spirit and, and God's spirit quickens your spirit, you become a renewed spirit, you see. And that's what God wants. Religion is neither soul or spirit. It can be either one. A soul religion does not change a person's nature. Most of the religions of the world are soulical religions. They're not spiritual religions that have to do with the Most High God. The soul with its desires, with its wishes, with its ambitions, fell when Adam fell in the Garden of Eden. And is contrary to God and, the hum and, and to the human spirit that God gives you. So the body in the Garden of Death came to the, in the Garden of Eden, death came to the body, it dies. The body is a servant to the soul to obey, and the soul is a, is a servant to be renewed by the spirit, which is your divine nature given to you by the breath of God when you confessed your sins and said, Lord, come into my heart. And he came into your heart and made you a new creature. And you'll never understand the difference between your soul and your spirit until Jesus Christ comes into your spirit and makes it new. And at that point in time, you'll say, now I know that which is spirit and that which is soul. I know that which is of Christ and that which is of Adam. I know that which is of the old and that which is of the new. I know that which belongs to man and that which belongs to God. And so the Word of God teaches us, as I've now shown you, and the Word of God shows us that the Bible is the divider of what is spirit and what is soul. And many people say, is it possible to do this? Is it allowable to do that? <laughs> is it soulish? Or spiritual there's your answer right there and the Bible gives you the answer let us walk in the spirit and not perform the lust of the flesh let us so walk in the spirit and let us always divide that which is soul and that which is spirit in Jesus name bless you the message you have just heard is now available in audio and video an audio tape is yours for a gift of any amount and a videotape for a gift of twenty dollars or more Please mention the program number on the screen when you communicate with us by either phone or mail. I am Peter Sumrall, and thanks for watching.